We are a group of young people living in Fermanagh concerned about the fracking industry. The Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment in our Northern Irish Assembly has given a licence to a private company called Tamboran to conduct fracking in our county. And we want to know what this could mean for us, our families and our communities. This is why we have worked on this film. We began by researching fracking on the internet, looking at both pro-fracking and anti-fracking sites. We made animations to learn about the fracking process. In the fracking process, a vertical well is drilled into the earth. This shaft goes through the water table and down to the shale rock below. The shaft then turns horizontal and the well is cased with concrete. Electrical charges are sent down the well which detonate small explosions, causing holes through the casing and cracks in the shale. Water, sand and chemicals are then pumped into the well at extremely high pressure. This mixture is forced into the holes created by the blasts and into the shale, creating numerous fractures through the rock. These fractures free the trapped gas which flows into the pipe and up to the surface where it is collected. The mixture of water, sand and chemicals returns to the surface and is stored in large reservoirs near the drilling pad. Okay, well, this is just a, a pad, a well that's just it's in the process of being fracked. As you can see from that tower there. Yeah. And then just behind it, this big pit with the water, that's where any of the wastewater that comes up from under the ground. And then in the background here, um, someone's house, so they've got a nice view from their backyard, just looking out onto the well site there, which is no doubt very noisy. Yeah. The first questions we asked were, where do Tamborn plan to frack? And how many wells will they construct? Uh, Tamborn have an exploration licence for approximately half of the area of the county of Fermanagh, and they also have a, a similar sort of licence uh, for most of Leitrim, North Leitrim, and parts of Sligo, and parts of Cavan. And within that area, they believe they have some core areas which they want to look at, of which um, North Leitrim and specifically the area between Derry Gonley uh, down towards um, Enniskillen, up to Belcoo and up towards Garrison, that sort of triangle is uh, the, the specific area in Fermanagh they want to prospect. In the heart of Fermanagh is St Mary's Primary School, Molly Mesker. Pupils here developed a project exploring fracking in their community. Fracking is short for hydraulic fracturing. It is a process of extracting natural gas from the shale rock layers deep within the earth. So this is the drill on the frack pad, the model we made. And these they undertook research and prepared an exhibition which they presented at the Royal Dublin Society Primary Science Fair. Um, here we have a map of Fermanagh and we put red dots to show which um, where they're going to put the frack pads and they're each exactly two miles away from each other. And the blue frack pads are in the south and the red frack pads are in the north. These dots do not mark the exact location of proposed frack pads but they do show the quantity and density that is planned. My understanding is that there will be 60 pads in Fermanagh and 60 pads in Leitrim initially. Right? Within those, that area, there's approximately going to be uh, 3,000 wells, so about 24 wells per pad. The shale that we have here, and they're also targeting some sandstone, is very thick and they want to go in at three different levels. So if you can imagine that they will have eight of these wells per pad going in at one level, eight at a secondary level, and eight at a third level. Um, in terms of the distance apart, again, we're looking at probably um, about a kilometre to a mile apart. Just to be clear then, in Fermanagh, Tamborn are initially planning to construct 60 pads, each pad will be seven to nine acres in size and will be concreted. The pads will be one to two kilometres apart. 
Each pad will include a 50 metre reservoir for the collection of flowback water. And the pads will be connected by access roads. Um, each, each red square here is a frack pad and here are pipes coming out of them. And when they'll fracture and make, and make cracks in the ground, cracks will connect with other cracks. Here are the pipes like I've shown on that picture. And here you might see this tiny brown bit here, which is the frack pad. But over here is steel pipes coming from it to pump the chemicals down. Uh, Tamborn have told us that the pads are going to be roughly seven acres in size. Um, so there will be a significant disturbance to the landscape when they're building these pads. Um, they have said that they will be uh, concreted and they have said also that they will have to construct something like a storage pond for water of approximately an Olympic sized swimming pool. Um, in terms of connecting the pads, they'll obviously have to build their own roads and obviously there will be the pipelines, um, there will be compressor stations and the other underlying thing that doesn't seem to get mentioned is the fact that we will have to have some sort of gas refinery uh, because the gas, as far as I can tell, and the only analysis done on the gas shows that it would not be suitable for direct injection into uh, transmission pipelines. It would have to be refined. Uh, this morning uh, we basically just came in and began discussing the environmental issue that is fracking and um, we learned that no one really, uh, no one was really sure about it or knew very much about it until we all went on the computers and did our own way research. Um, it was really easy to find information on the subject but it was just going through it and deciding what you could use but I, I seem to have found that uh, there appears to be more negatives than positives. Um, if jobs were to be advertised in the fracking industry, would you be tempted to take one of them? We then prepared a series of questions and went out into our communities in Fermanagh to interview a range of people on their views. The main areas we have explored are the likely impacts of fracking on farming, tourism, employment, health, our communities and our environment. This film is what we have found. I'm John Sheridan and uh, I live in Florence Court, which is a, a rural area with a small hamlet uh, centred between uh, Quilke Mountain behind me here and uh, Belmore uh, to, the, to the north. I've been a farmer all my life uh, and farming to Fermanagh uh, would really be its main industry. The economic value of farming in Fermanagh would be about, um, well, there's six counties in Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland's agricultural output is about uh, 3.9 billion, so it's worth about a half a billion uh, or more uh, to Fermanagh. The agricultural and food processing sector in Northern Ireland has a gross turnover of around £3.9 billion. It includes almost 25,000 farms and provides work for about 47,000 people. Jessica Ernst has worked for 30 years as an environmental impact assessment consultant to the oil and gas industry in Canada. She visited Fermanagh to share her personal experiences of the impact of fracking within her own rural farming community. Oh, the impacts to the farmers on the land the farmers own can be quite dire. Be careful what you believe. The amount of money that sounds like you're going to get for the leases is often much less. And even the promises in writing on the leases, farmers in Alberta find they have to fight and fight and fight to get the payments that they were promised. And when the wells are abandoned, or if they don't turn out the way they are, or if they do cause gas migration. In Alberta, they're finding the gas migration problem to become so serious from the fracking and the, the, the leaking well bores that they've now put the liability of gas migration at the lease site onto the farmer, onto the person who owns the land. And for a buffer area around the well, even when it's long gone, 
The farmer is not allowed to build anything there, but he gets no money for that. Really, the industry has taken that land away for free. And the farmers are left with the consequences. We're promised, uh, actually, by uh, Tom Bourne, who are proposing this exploration, that uh, they will not use chemicals. But this would be a first. Chemicals uh, have always been used before in high level fracturing, which is only uh, young. It's only since 2005 that this uh, high density fracking has come in. Uh, this would be a first in Fermanagh to never use chemicals. If you don't use chemicals, uh, as far as I'm aware, you've got to increase the pressure by 20%. So, uh, and, and Cornell University, as far as I know, have said that it was not, would not be possible without chemicals. The promise of no chemicals, we were also told. And we were told that Encana would only frack with air, with nitrogen, pure as the air that we breathe, and that it would actually only stimulate nature who did the fracking for the company. And uh, we saw lots and lots of pallets of chemicals on sites. They didn't, of course, disclose the chemicals they need to use to drill and service the wellbore. And you cannot have fracking without a wellbore. Even if they could design fracks to be perfectly chemical free and drill perfectly chemical free, they are bringing up unknowns that have been locked for millennia underground radioactivity, heavy metals, and salts, and benzenes, and other toxics. These will likely be stored in ponds uh, that might overflow. So then you will get runoff into your creeks. They may end up in your lakes. And they will, they're volatile, some of them, so they will evaporate into the air. And if these start to accumulate, again, you may end up with toxics in some of your very pure lakes. Your agriculture industry is known for its clean water and air. What if these start to show up in your dairy products? Even if no chemicals are used, the natural chemicals and the natural uh, toxins coming out of the ground uh, are going quite likely to um, spill over from the ponds that they're held in. Uh, you're in uh, nearly a 60 inch rainfall for man at the present time and it beggars belief how sooner or later there will no, won't be a spill into the groundwater. Uh, and look, the, um, I think it's recognised that 5% of the wells leak on initiation and that over the space of their lifetime, 50% leak. So how you can have anything 100%, I really have got to doubt. The question of the drilling waste, there's two, two issues there. There's the fracking waste, of course, but I'd like to point out just the, con the, the, the concerns about the drilling waste. They produce a lot of it. It can be radioactive. It can have heavy metals like mercury, arsenic, barium, copper may be a concern. It can have salts that, of course, kill the grasses and the land and render it unusable can also have your b taxes which are your benzenes, ethyl benzene, toluene, these are toxic. And what the companies don't want to do is haul this waste to a hazardous waste facility. It's too expensive, takes too much time. So in Alberta, they ask the farmers for a little bit of money and the promise that this is free fertilizer to spread it, like agricultural slurry, on the agricultural land. If it's a windy day, which I hear Ireland can be and, and I've seen, the waste when they're spreading it will disperse in the wind. So we don't know what we're breathing. And nobody knows what the chronic low level exposure effects are from low levels of radioactivity in this waste. But it could get into the food. And what if you get benzene, a known carcinogen, into your dairy and into your baby formula, which I have heard is a very big industry in Ireland. I think these are very important questions Ireland needs to get honestly and completely answered from the companies and the government and very detailed socioeconomic impact assessments need to made, be made on the consequences of just the drilling waste that must be disposed of and that I have not heard from the company how this is going to be done. It's a big hole in the story that they are not telling. 
On the 23rd of February 2012, the National Farmers Union in Canada issued the following statement. The NFU represents thousands of family farms across Canada. At its 2011 annual convention, members passed a landmark resolution calling for a moratorium on the use of hydraulic fracturing of subsurface oil and gas formations. Uh, from my knowledge of the area and, uh, and the limestone area that, that, that's underneath the ground in Fermanagh, uh, I truthfully, it beggars belief to think that uh, farming and fracking could go together. It's going to be one or the other. Farming communities around the world are already experiencing the negative consequences of fracking. Fracking fluids are seeping out into the air, soil and water. Flowback water is bringing to the surface highly toxic substances that include lead, mercury, arsenic, benzene and radioactive elements. Livestock exposed to fracking fluids have become ill and died, causing lost productivity and expensive vet bills. Farmers are reporting stillborn and malformed offspring. Land polluted by fracking fluids has become too acidic to support viable farming. Farmers have been left with the responsibility for the clear up of chemical leakages on their land at their own expense. Farmers have also suffered enforced access and compulsory purchase of land for pipelines and construction. One incident of the chemical benzene in our milk or meat would destroy confidence and have a huge negative impact on our agri-food industry. Farmland has dropped in value in fracking areas. Uh, my name is Marius Leonard, uh, I live here at uh, Coralay Activity Centre and uh, we run uh, an outdoor business with self-catering and outdoor activities. Uh, tourism is very important in Fermanagh, um, it uh, generates uh, £36 million pounds per annum for the economy. Uh, it also employs in this immediate area uh, between Balik and Florence Court uh, and Belcou um, about 450 people employed there plus volunteers uh, so it is very very important. Uh, the same tourists that come here um, as well as coming to say a Coralie activity centre they also will have to eat and they will also have a drink so they will be buying food from a restaurant or having a drink in a pub uh, or buying from the local shops and hence that employs more and more people so there's a spin-off from the direct tourists that stay here. Well, the main reason why people do come here to Fermanagh is because of its uh, nature and because of its uh, landscape. The recent survey was conducted that 80% of the people who came to Fermanagh came here to look at its landscape, its caves, its forests, its uh, lakes, etc. etc. Well, the impact could uh, be several things. Uh, one is that it will uh, uh, damage the water that's just behind us here, the lake. It can pollute that. And if the water's polluted, then nobody wants to go canoeing or jumping and swimming in the water. Um, it could, it'll ha have an impact with the air quality, and uh, therefore nobody want, want to come here to breathe nice fresh air if it's going to be contaminated with all sorts of chemicals and uh, airborne pollu uh, particles. Uh, my name is Terry McGovern, and I am the chairman of the local fishing club, Garrison Lock Melvin Anglers Association which uh, uh, has the run of the waters here in Loch Melvin. Uh, Loch Melvin is very important to the local community. We would have a lot of anglers coming here over the year. It's very important to uh, the local hotels, restaurants and pub public uh, houses. Without Loch Melvin, this village would be pure dead. They depend mostly on the fishing in, in, in this small area. There is no other employment here and our main, our main income is of fishing. Loch Melvin is internationally renowned uh, we do run a big competition here every year, the Garrison Lock Melvin Open, and uh, we attract something like 500 anglers here for the weekend. 500 anglers, a lot of those have their wives, girlfriends with them. 500 people coming into a small village at Garrison for the weekend is a lot of people. If we lost Lock Melvin, we'd have lost a lot. We'd have lost our big competition, we'd have lost everything. We have got a very unique type of fish here. We have Gillaroo and Sonahan that are to be found nowhere else in Europe, only here. 
If fracking comes to Fermanagh, I think their biggest worry would be that they're going to extract something like uh, half of the water of like Loch Melvin will be extracted and used for fracking. And that water will be released back into Loch Melvin again. In what state it comes back into Loch Melvin, that's our biggest worry. We have enhanced the rivers around Loch Melvin. We drew down grant money for the, in the region of 150 to 200,000 over the last 10 years. We spent that money on the rivers and at present we're doing a, a, a programme at the salmon hatchery up in Marlbank. We have taken out f uh, around 40,000 uh, salmon eggs and uh, at the moment they're being hatched up in the hatchery up in Marlbank and they will be released into the headwaters of the Garrison River now in the early April. If water is released back into our rivers and our, and our spawning beds, if there's chemicals used or there's chemicals in that water, they could destroy our spawning beds and destroy our rivers forever. There is about seven or eight hundred jobs between full-time jobs and part-time jobs. Well, if fracking goes ahead and there again, if, if, if we haven't got the fish dock, them jobs will also be gone. 85% of the license is sold in, in, in Northern Ireland, is sold in Fermanagh. If fracking comes to Fermanagh and we lose our fish docks, that income is also lost. My name is Richard Watson, I'm the manager of the Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark, which is a cross-border geopark jointly operated by Fermanagh District Council and Calvin County Council. Many people wonder what a geopark is. Essentially, it's an area of outstanding geological interest which is recognised by UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. Here in Fermanagh, it stretches from basically the border with Donegal at Balik right down to nearly Calvin Town. So, it's, as I say, it's cross-border. Not all of that land is in the geopark, of course, but we, across it we have about 22,000 hectares of different sites and uh, areas where the public or have guaranteed access. That brings in places like Quilca Mountain, Marble Arch Caves obviously as a flagship site, parts of Loch Erne and um, many state forests such as obviously Loch Navarre Forest which is another one of the jewels in the geopark. The Fermanagh landscape serves very well for the geopark because it is a great place to show how people have interacted with the land around them and with the rocks beneath their feet over millennia. Um, we have wonderful sedimentary geology, limestone, sandstone, shales, and we have a great succession of these coming down in layers. We have some individual sites which are brilliant for interpreting those, Marble Arch Caves obviously being a classic one. Um, but we also have, imprinted on that, we have a wonderful archaeology and social history, all of which comes together very well to make that story. So a geopark is a holistic thing. It's, it's not just for specialists, it's for everybody and everybody can get something out of it. We're, we're often asked about our visitors, where they come from. Essentially, they come from all over the world. We get um, families, we get school groups, we get tourists, backpackers, everybody. We also, of course, get a, quite a good sprinkling of uh, research people, scientists, university students, Numbers wise, overall, the Geopark, we think, gets something in the order of about 250,000 visitors a year. So when you, when you take those numbers uh, and extrapolate them against government statistics on visitor spend, we think that we're generating something like about 6.5 million a year uh, across the, the wider Geopark. And on top of that, we're attracting incoming funding through the European Union. So over the next three years, for instance, we have two million pounds a year to spend on the geopark in both Fermanagh and Calvin. So adding that up, we're somewhere in the order of about nine million a year, we think. We greatly value our geopark status and recognize the importance of this designation to Fermanagh. We sought therefore to address a simple question. If fracking comes to Fermanagh, would that jeopardize our geopark status? European geopark members must sign up to the European Geopark Charter produced by founding members in the year 2000. Clause 22 and 24 of this charter state. Are there any statutory restrictions attached to being a member of the European Geoparks Network? No. The European Geopark designation has no legal status and does not imply any level of protection or restriction within a geoparks territory. Such measures can only ensue from national legislation. Is the selling of original geological material, e.g. rocks, minerals, fossils, permitted within a geopark? No. 
the selling or destruction of the geological value of a geopark or of material by organisations that form part of the geopark structure is not permitted. Precise details concerning this aspect of the Charter are available upon request, but it does not refer to quarried or mined material for industrial or domestic use that is quarried or mined under national legislation. It appears then that geoparks and fracking can coexist and that our European geopark status offers no protection against fracking. However, we believe that the viability and appeal of a geopark and visitor centre in the heart of a frack landscape must be of great concern. I personally don't believe we can have uh, fracking and tourism at the same time. Um, I feel sad that the politicians in the county here are not more aware of the danger of this business. Suddenly this industry has been invited in here without our consultation and without the consultation of the local people. In April 2009, the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment, Arlene Foster, MLA, commissioned a new strategy for tourism in Northern Ireland to provide a clear vision and action plan through to the year 2020. According to the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, tourism in Fermanagh generates about £36 million each year. The Jetty Draft strategy states that Northern Ireland needs to value tourism, value the tourist, value what the tourist values. There is also a real recognition that what makes Northern Ireland special is the quality of the experience and any development must be sensitive to this. My name is Sean Sweeney, I'm from Belcoo. I've lived in Belcoo all my life and I live here now with my family with four mile outside Belcoo, uh, my wife, five kids. When Tamborne released their figures about the employment, um, there was a lot of confusion because the figures changed dramatically over a period of time. Initially, the headlines in the papers was 600 jobs for Fermanagh, and I mean, that was fantastic news, you know. But when they were asked to clarify this, it suddenly became, well, no, 600 jobs in total, both sides of the border, within the whole fracking area. So you were talking maybe 300 jobs for Fermanagh. And then I believe that in 2011, last year, Tam Boring came out and with another new figure, which was three jobs per pad, with an estimated 60 pads in Fermanagh. The figure was down then to 180. Jobs in prosperity. We were promised the same promises that Ireland is getting about jobs and prosperity. The jobs, well, they bring their own crews. And the one job that was provided to our, community, to our community was the unglamorous one of hauling the waste away. And I don't think they disclosed what that waste was. Then there were the promises of the indirect jobs to the inns and the restaurants. But the crews didn't stay there. They wanted to stay in the areas that had more active things for them to do. So they drove in and out and the indirect jobs didn't happen either. The prosperity, well, some of the farmers get, of course, the least money, doesn't, it doesn't really cover the damages. And the money was promised to parts of the community, not everyone, so the prosperity is definitely, for us in our experience, was not for all, for some, for a select few, the obedient few. And then when the drilling was done, the prosperity goes. I don't think that, um, you know, the jobs they're offering, I don't think they're going to outweigh the potential losses that we would get in agriculture and tourism. Tourism in Fermanagh creates about 640 jobs in the fracking license area, with a further 778 jobs underpinned by the angling industry alone. Agriculture in Fermanagh employs about 5,000 people with agriculture, forestry, fishing and hunting making up about 11% of Fermanagh's labour force. Will fracking undermine these jobs? And what if a fracking accident were to occur? It's not a case of if there's an accident, it's when there's an accident. You cannot sort of work on that intensity, you know, and not have an accident. And when there's an accident, I mean, you take something as simple as the fishing industry leave tourism and leave agriculture out of the equation, just the fishing industry. If that was affected, there's over 700 jobs in that alone. And you weigh that against the 180 jobs that may be there for, that Tam Bourne are offering. 
the figures just don't add up. If the jobs were to be advertised in the fracking industry 12 months ago, I would have jumped at it. I would have said, definitely. How, how, why would I refuse a job? I've got five kids to raise, you know, I have a mortgage to pay, bills to pay. Um, but I mean, I looked into it and to be honest with you, no, absolutely not. For the very simple reason, when I looked into this further and done a little bit of research on it, because the information is out there, it's out there if you just look for it, you know, these people are dealing with, with toxic waste and chemicals. Why would I expose myself to that? And why would I expose my kids to that? And I believe they're talking, I mean, they're going to be across the border, but they're talking coming from the border, the whole way along here, and on up to Garrison and heading towards maybe Derrigonley or whatever, you know? And um, I think they're just going to just, could you imagine what that's going to look like? Covered in, I mean, 80,000 acres, you know, 80,000 acres of land covered in concrete pads, seven acres in size, in steel, you know, and the lorries, everything. I mean, they've destroyed, the, the, it, it will destroy, it'll take, house prices will drop, they're bad enough as it is. Ironically, it is believed that some estate agents in Inniskillen have already begun the process of buying up land on behalf of fracking companies. We believe this to be very short-term thinking, as the housing market in Fermanagh is likely to be devastated should fracking go ahead. How does Fermanagh promote itself then, you know? For example, the Ulster Way walks and the forestry plantation walks, up to 80,000 people used them last year, you know? How do we, they used them because they were sold as clean, as green, as, you know, get in touch with nature. You know, how do we sell them now? Do we sell them as, you know, on your right, the flora and fauna of, of Fermanagh, you know, on your left, 80,000 acres of concrete steel and toxic waste, you know. Mind you don't get run down by the lorries and don't forget your gas mask and earplugs. In Fermanagh they're doing shallow fracking. This is bad because they're very close to the water table and the gas could get into the water table. There is conventional fracking on the right hand side here and there's unconventional fracking here on the left. This means that this one here is not is very dangerous because you're going down vertically and across horizontally. This one's just going down vertically. This is not really that dangerous but this one is. Because in Ireland, we, it's quite rare to have two water tables. And when they set off the explosives, there's cracks all around. And these cracks are like little tubes for the gas to go in. And they can go in our both water tables, and that's the water we drink from. One of the big concerns is the gas migration rising up the well bores. The industry has a chronic problem of leaking gas up their well bore. And people think that as time goes on, their technologies are getting better. But in fact, the research is showing that their gas migration problem is getting much worse. We were told that promise, double layers, triple layers of pipe protects us. I've heard that Ireland's been given the same promise, but what they didn't tell us, and it doesn't appear that the government or the company is telling Ireland, is that they have to shoot holes in those pipes with which to do their fracks and they commingle those pipes with lots and lots of holes in lots of different zones. They might come in and just do one zone in the beginning, but then they'll come back and they keep shooting more and more holes. The gas production doesn't turn out the way they want it. So then they come back and shoot more holes again. And no one has studied the cumulative effects or the damages to the cement seal that's supposed to line these pipes and protect us from gas migration. We were promised almost identical, the same promise that Ireland has been told that fracking would only happen way deep below the drinking water aquifers or the freshwater aquifers and far below any impermeable zones to prevent gas from migrating up to surface. Well, I found out from data on the regulator database 
that the company had actually fractured directly into our freshwater drinking supply repeatedly with numerous wells. So they violated that promise before they had even made the promise. The um, minimum depth that you can frack or that you can get gas from is about 500 meters. Otherwise, the pressure of the overlying rock will not be enough to force the gas out. The interesting thing here to look at is to look at the depth because you can see that um, approximately 1,200 meters is where the deepest target area is and it goes all the way up as far as 500 meters and indeed even closer to the surface. The nature of the shale here is that it's shallow so any, any fracking that happens here is regarded as shallow fracking. There cannot be any other explanation for it or any other description of it. Okay, so my name's Tim Fogg and I've been living in Fermanagh for around about 30 years now. Uh, I came to act as a, uh, an outdoor instructor uh, and since then we started a business here which was involving working on ropes, travelling the world with natural history film crews and looking after them at height in trees and on cliffs while they're filming wildlife. I think the most memorable places that I've worked for, from a wildlife point of view, uh, have got to be the rainforests of the world, um, from Costa Rica and the Amazon to Borneo, where we're often working at the tops of the massive tropical trees, trying to capture films of gibbons, of hornbills. And the other most striking for me, I think, is the Arctic, um, where we've been working filming polar bears and working some very big holes which have developed in the ice uh, where water rushes in underneath the ice caps. Those are, the, to me, are the most extreme and exciting environments I've worked in. The reason I enjoy and will always come back to Fulana is that it is uh, still pretty pristine in many, many ways. It has, for me, the caves and the mountains which I've visited now time and time again over the 30 years, really haven't changed very much in that time, which is fantastic because in other parts of the world where I've been back after 10 years, massive change, all the forest gone, just palm oil plantations where there were fabulous rainforests. And in the Arctic, places that had ice now just don't have ice in the summer. But for manner present, is maintaining its beauty and its natural environment, which is its strength. Beneath our feet in Fermanagh is limestone. The limestone's a unique rock in that water flows through it, through cracks in it, creating caves. Many of us will know about the Marble Arch. That's just one of many, many cave systems in Fermanagh that takes water underground and moves water around underground in Fermanagh. So it sinks up on the mountains, into holes, disappears into these caves and then pops up as springs down in the valleys. The interesting thing is, is that we just don't know where a lot of the water that pops up in the valleys, where it comes from. We haven't done that research to discover the flow of water underground. Some of it is completely unknown, some is partially understood but there is still a lot to discover and a lot to find out about in the hydrology, which is the flow of water in Fermanagh. So I was talking about the hydrology of Fermanagh and the complexity of the water flow underground in Fermanagh. And we're now here in Belcou at St. Patrick's Holy Well. And this is a classic example of uh, water rising at, in this pool. There's about 45 litres per second coming out from underground here but we don't know where it comes from it's coming from here and it's flowing in this case down into Loch McNeen uh, which is international water there are numerous places like this around Fermanagh where springs rise and the water flows down into the lakes Loch Erne, Loch Melvin and in many cases we don't know where the water is sinking underground to start with or coming from in the context of fracking and in the context of this complex hydrology, this underground water flow, I think we have a real problem. We, can't, we don't know where the water goes. We don't understand the flow. We don't know the channels it follows. We don't know the reservoirs of water that exist there. 
So how, with any confidence, can it be drilled into and, and potentially polluted and this controlled? I and mean, it just does not add up with me that you could just move into this area and drill without understanding the hydrology. And we don't understand the hydrology. My name is Anja Rösler. I am originally from Germany, but I've been living here in Fermanagh for the last 15 years. I am a trained ecologist. I specialized in landscape ecology, botany and nature conservation. And this is still the area of work that I am engaged in. I do a lot of environmental surveys, plant and habitat surveys in particular. And I also um, I'm involved in a lot of environmental education projects for adults and children. The first thing to say about County Fermanagh in terms of its biodiversity is that it's an incredibly rich and varied county all the way from the wet lowlands occupied by Upper and Lower Loch Erne and all the little satellite lakes, you go all the way up to subalpine mountain tops with Kulka Mountain and everything in between. So you have a huge array of habitats and hence flora and fauna associated with these habitats. In a Northern Ireland context, except from coastal and marine habitats, any other habitat that occurs in Northern Ireland is probably present here in Fermanagh, which explains the huge importance um, in, in an Irish context. Uh, my name is Brad Robson, I'm the Fermanagh Area Manager for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which is the largest conservation charity in Europe. Uh, we manage two nature reserves here in the county, one on Lower Loch Erne and one up on Quirka Mountain. Uh, Fermanagh is extremely important in a, uh, in a Northern Irish context and an all-island context and even in a UK context uh, for its wildlife and very wide variety of habitats and species and the reason for that is, is that we have a very uh, diverse landscape. We have the lowlands, the lakes, the islands and the wetland shores. We also then have the upland areas of Pedagal Plateau, Quilka Mountain and here where we are up in Loch Navar we have this area of limestone and blanket bog. So Fermanagh uh, is very diverse and consequently holds populations of a, a wide range of, of in some cases scarce and declining species and in some cases holds very important populations which have disappeared from other parts of the country. In Fermanagh, the uh, huge variety we have here of habitats and biodiversity is reflected in the large number of ASSIs. That abbreviation stands for Area of Special Scientific Interest and that special interest can be either geological or biological. The biological ones could be anything from rare plants to assemblages of birds to wintering birds even. And we have a total of 87 ASSIs in Fermanagh, one of which straddles the border with County Tyrone and combined to cover an area of nearly 19,000 hectares. Back in the mid-1980s, a survey of Northern Ireland found that there was an estimated 5,000 pairs of curlews across the whole of Northern Ireland and it was an incredibly common bird across the whole of Ireland. We now know that across the whole of, of Ireland there are only at most 400 pairs and only about 200 of those in the north. Uh, and of those 200, Fermanagh has 100 pairs of them. So we have 50% of the Northern Irish population and something like 25% of the all island population. Biodiversity worldwide is first of all very fragile and secondly threatened at the moment. And the greatest threat really is habitat destruction on a global and hence on a, on a local scale. And connected with that is also habitat fragmentation. Habitats get more and more fragile the more um, isolated they are because species can't wander from one spot to another. So the fact that in Fermanagh we still have large areas that are very well connected, so species like the pine marten or red squirrels can actually travel through the countryside along hedgerows and along linear woodlands and, and ditches is, is very important. The bogs themselves are very important really for two species. One would be breeding golden plover and we only have an estimated of maybe 12 to 15 pairs of golden plover left in Northern Ireland and the majority of them are here in Fermanagh. Uh, we also have an important population of the Irish form of red grouse which is left in a stronghold in, west, in the west of Ireland and, and also is found here in, in Fermanagh. We have to remember that Fermanagh is not just important for the birds that breed here during the, the spring and summer, but also it's very important for wintering wildfowl and for migratory birds. In particular, Hooper swans, which breed in Iceland, migrate down into Ireland, and uh, Upper Loch Erne is internationally important uh, for, for wintering Hooper swans. 
So it's been designated as a special protection area for that very reason. And as well as the hooper swans, we have very large numbers of other wildfowl, which come from a colossal geographic area. We get Greenland white-fronted geese from Greenland. We get tufted ducks coming from Central Europe and potchard. And birds are traveling huge distances to spend the winter here in Fermanagh. So it's as, it's as important for those species as it is for our breeding birds in the summer. Local habitats here in County Fermanagh um, are very fragile habitats, that would be the first thing. So any large-scale industrial development in an area like this would have potentially devastating impacts purely by the fact that it is here, purely by the fact that it's um, very invasive, that it brings about a large level of disturbance. Again, habitat fragmentations that I mentioned before, if you have a large block of a fairly intact habitat and you cut it in half by a road or a pipeline, it is much less than the, the two parts that you create because of the disturbance levels. Uh, it's called the edge effect, which is not quite fully understood yet, but we know it plays an important role in the disappearance of many populations of endangered species. A lot of species that we have here in County Fermanagh are already struggling and have been declining over the last decades. And I think the introduction of large scale industry could pos possibly push a lot of species over the edge. People may say that would, I'm just talk, sitting here talking about birds and wildlife and why is that important? You know, there are many more things in life uh, which, which are of higher importance. But these things are, uh, I think, fundamentally important to the lives that we lead. They enrich our lives. They're important for our children to grow up and know something about. And they have a value uh, um, in themselves and that it's our responsibility to look after some of these areas and to talk about them so that in years to come, people aren't just looking back at a, at a monoculture of, a, of, of, of a, a landscape free of wildlife that really isn't of any interest whatsoever. In 2012, the RSPB in Northern Ireland issued the following statement. The RSPB is very concerned that unconventional gas developments are currently not regulated strongly enough to ensure that the potential environmental impacts are properly addressed. The most significant risks that have not been adequately examined to date are that of accidental pollution of groundwater and methane leakage. Direct habitat loss is also a very significant concern in priority habitat areas, including designated and functionally related sites. It is important to note that both the individual footprint and cumulative impact of these sites could be significant, leading to habitat loss and fragmentation. My name is uh, Dr. Carol O'Donnell, I'm a GP. I live in County Fermanagh, uh, Florence Court, County Fermanagh, and I'm a GP in Black Lion County Cavan, seven miles away. Uh, I have many concerns about fracking, but being a doctor, obviously my main concern would be health. Public health covers the whole aspects of both immediate and long-term issues. And so the risk of contamination of air, soil and water that can feed through to humans either directly or via animal ingestion. So there's concerns about increased risk of asthma, increased risks of skin problems, and that's in the uh, relatively near future. And then the other issues long term are increased risks of cancer, ill health involving uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system damage. I'm going to talk about some health facts. 90% of the negative effect is on skin, eyes and sensory organs. 50% is on brain and 25% can cause, can cause cancer and DNA mutations. In areas of the world where fracking has occurred already, there has already been health impact noted. The main type of modern fracking has only been around for about 10 years, so what's called traditional fracking of 60 years ago, the research doesn't show any major implications, but the modern high volume high horizontal hydraulic fracking has shown to have significant impacts in most of the America where it's been done the longest. They have noticed an increased risk of death and miscarriage in animals. In humans, there's an increase in respiratory disease, also some cardiovascular disease, that's heart attacks and high blood pressure. There's longer term studies just beginning to look into the risk of long term problems. Dr. Eilish Cleary is Chief Medical Officer for New Brunswick Province in Canada. She is one of very few health professionals to have conducted health research 
around the fracking industry. She visited Fermanagh to share her research with the local community. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Health for one of the provinces in Canada, the province of New Brunswick. And uh, in, in my role, I'm responsible for the, the health of the population of that province. So when the question about uh, shale gas development came up, uh, one of the questions was, well, what's the impact of this going to be for this province? And so, of course, uh, the perspective that I uh, looked at this was, well, what will this mean for the people? When a person gets sick, of course, it's important that they have doctors and nurses and so on to go to. Um, but really, when we think about what makes us healthy as people, it's also about how we get on with each other, the communities we live in, and how healthy our environment is. I think one of the things that is different about this industry is the potential for it to be close uh, to individual houses and to in, to in communities. Typically we see industrial development in sort of areas at one part of the uh, of a town, for example, in an industrial estate. Um, but with this industry, you know, it often is in, in farmers' fields or in forested areas. And that's why um, it is very important to plan carefully about where this industry should be allowed or not allowed. I think our report was important because it does provide um, some information on health that can lead to informed decision making. It, it took a look at uh, what we know and what we don't know about this industry and its impact on health. And what we found was that there's a lot of things that we don't know yet. There really is a lack of uh, clear information as to its impact on health because quite frankly people haven't been looking. One of the recommendations in Dr. Cleary's report focuses on health impact assessment and says there has been a general lack of comprehensive analysis and forecasting of potential health effects in nearby communities that could arise from large-scale unconventional gas development projects. However, suitable methodologies to fill this gap, such as health impact assessments, are available and should be used. The recommendation continues. There is one notable case to date from the Colorado School of Public Health where a comprehensive health impact assessment has been conducted in a shale gas development area. This study identified potential risks related to chemical exposures, accidents, psychological impacts such as depression, anxiety and stress, and social impacts. There is a, a study from a, a professor in the Cornell University Veterinary Medical School and this data uh, in these studies have shown sudden death, slow deaths, reproductive problems, neurological disease have been documented in 24 different incidents involving hundreds of farm animals over six states in the USA. This was six states out of 20 that were fracking, so that's almost one third of the states had significant impact on animals. He goes on to state that animals are like a sentinel marker for humans because our, we tend to develop diseases more slowly than animals. And he gives a quote, without rigorous scientific studies, the shale gas drilling boom sweeping the world today will remain an uncontrolled health experiment on enormous scale. That is quite worrisome because we realise that the studies are beginning to come through and it's also been shown that even if you don't use chemicals in the initial stages of fracking, what comes back up is very, very contaminated. These are the things that come up on a regular basis from underground. Benzene causes leukemia and cancers neural tube defects, that's spina bifida in humans. Mercury causes brain and kidney damage and affects the developing fetus. Arsenic causes cancer. Ethyl benzene causes respiratory disease, fatigue and headaches. Toluene causes birth defects and central nervous system damage. Xylene causes headaches, balance and memory problems. Volatile organic compounds, which are now known to be endocrine disruptors. These are very low levels of chemicals that can knock out our messenger hormone systems in our body. And long term, over 15, 20 years, these will then result in ill health. These studies show that these chemicals will be coming back up in the what's called flow back water. Even if there's no chemicals used, what's coming back up carries these risks because these chemicals will be present in a greater or lesser extent. One of the other impacts from this industry is air pollution. They're very secretive about it. The volatile 
Organics will breathe them in the air. They're flared off. They will evaporate off the ponds, the waste ponds. You'll have all the air pollution from the diesel rigs and the vehicles coming through your, your communities. And some of these are very toxic. You will have your communities breathing benzene and others that are known carcinogens and neurotoxins and endocrine disruptor, disruptors. To be healthy, we really have to have control over what affects us. And unless we're given the opportunity to be engaged, to ask questions, to have input into decisions over things that affect us, well then, that it really can impact badly on our health and on the health of the community. Uh, my name is Kathleen Ritchie. Uh, I've lived in the Black Lion area for uh, almost 50 years since I got married. Uh, before that, I lived, uh, I was born and reared in County Fermanagh, went to school in uh, County Fermanagh and uh, spent all my uh, working life uh, in, in County Fermanagh. We've had, we've had uh, lots of meetings, petitions, people have signed, signed a lot of petitions, but when you don't, when all uh, all this was arranged uh, before people knew anything about it. It's very difficult to know uh, how you can counteract it. Nobody, nobody uh, that I know of was con contacted in the area about whether they wanted fracking or not. It was a roundabout way of doing things uh, to have it all fait accompli before people knew anything about it. The, this is a lovely, a lovely area and uh, I mean that's what appeals to people who come to visit it, the nice greenness and everything. But if uh, fracking uh, were to take place, who knows what it would look like? A wilderness perhaps. What is the place going to look like covered with acres of concrete and, and the amount of lorries uh, that would be going hither and thither? Your rural community becomes an industrialized zone and the, the impacts get more and more and more. First, they'll start with the pad and the well, and that's all that'll be there for a while. And then comes a tank and another tank and a bigger tank, and then a pump jack to pump out the wastewater, and then a compressor and another compressor and another compressor, and soon you have six of them lined up in a row. That's just some of the visual impacts. Roads more and more roads going into these facilities. Another impact is the noise from the unconventional oil and gas. And the noise will, it will go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These crews come in and they'll rotate shifts. They'll promise the world, oh no, we won't have it after 11 and we won't do it through the night. We won't move our crews in the night, but they broke a lot of those promises. The compressor noise in my community went like a jet engine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it disrupts your sleep. It drives you crazy when you're outside. It's very annoying because you can't turn it off. With the unconventional gas drilling comes an unprecedented amount of facilities and flaring and rigs with lots and lots of very bright lights. So you lose your night sky, which I think is a big impact for tourism. Negative impact. When you have the kids getting to school on the bus, we've had workers racing through our 30 kilometer an hour playground zone going 80 kilometers per hour. That was by the company's own speed survey. And 
we asked for the police to come to try to control some of the traffic. They said they had no money, the cutbacks couldn't send them. Then you have damages to the roads. We had millions of dollars of damages to our newly paved highways in our community. They were not designed for these big trucks. We have straight roads on the prairie here in Ireland. There are lots of bends in the roads here, which means an incredible amount of cumulative impacts to your roads. The taxpayers in our community were left paying for the damages. Some of the damages were so high, they took the paved roads back to gravel because the counties couldn't afford to maintain the damages that Encana was causing. Yes, the companies bring some taxes, but they do not cover the damages. They make the people pay for them. My name is Richard Ierson. I live just outside Monet and I'm an environmental farmer. I'm not convinced that the people of Fermanagh are yet fully uh, aware of the scale of the operations of um, fracking if it comes here. Um, Tamboran's own figures have suggested that ultimately, ultimately there could be 9,000 uh, fracked wells in um, West Fermanagh and North Leitrim. Um, each of those wells will take nearly 2,000 tonnes of sand. That means the transport for the sand alone will have a tremendous impact on the roads in Fermanagh. And that is just one very, very small aspect of the whole um, uh, fracking procedure. Um, so I would implore everybody before they make a, um, a decision or form an opinion to actually find out, start doing the, the math themselves, start looking at the logistics just to see how this can be, um, take place without it having a terribly detrimental effect on the people and the environment of Fermanagh. Uh, the, the local area would be bound to be affected because first of all they need millions of gallons uh, to pump into these fracking systems and where would they get it? The lake. Uh, fracking is something that um, uh, we haven't had experience of but I, I personally have seen uh, and heard people talking about it who have had experience and I wouldn't like to think that that was going to happen in our, our lovely area. Uh, my name is Shauna McMorrow. I live in Belcoo and I am currently an assistant rowing coach in at Petora Royal School. I think um, fracking will have a very big effect, a very big negative effect on our communities. Um, from my own research into what's happened in other fracking communities, I find that there tends to be a lot of division and I'm just worried that if it comes here, there will be lo some local farmers will decide to take up the gas company's offers of buying up their land and that can create a bit of conflict with other farmers who've decided that they don't want that on their land for fear of pollution and things like that. And in Belcoo, we are a border community, like the south is just across the bridge here. Um, we're kind of moving through a lot of cross-community relations, you know, we're moving past conflict and things like that. So we don't really want to be taking a step back and having divisions among our community again. I used to think that losing my water and having too dangerous a water to have in my home was the worst impact from fracking. I have learned that it's actually the division of community. They'll promise money to some and only a few get the money. The most don't. And the promises that people keep hoping will come creates an obedience to the company in some. And it ends up dividing communities. Companies are very shrewd at learning how to use the ones waiting for the promises to betray their neighbors. Some of the betrayals to me have been heartbreaking. And it ends up destroying the community. I find the rural communities no longer are, are sustainable. They no longer take care of themselves the way they used to. They need to rely on the promises and they hang on them. They would take care of themselves if they needed a new roof for a community building. Now they run to the companies and there's a loss of pride and a loss of being able to protect your own. And I think that's a very important impact to the people in the communities that nobody's looking at. One other concern that I would have um, is that the kind of industry that fracking is the gas industry. They have a lot of 
people who a lot of young males who would come in to do the work on the wells and um, they get paid a lot of money and then they kind of leave and I'd just be worried about what kind of effect that would have on local communities them coming in maybe an increase in the drug trade sex trade and things like that so it could be a potential to bring a lot of damaging um, influences into our society. Um, if fracking was to happen I don't see myself staying in Fermanagh. Um, I had always thought that I would go travelling and maybe settle down in Fermanagh again with my kids because it is a beautiful county, you know, it's very quiet, rural, it's, it's beautiful scenery. But if it starts to be fracked um, with the pollution and things like that and the lack of jobs that would be about, I don't really see how I could settle down here. Having focused on our own communities, we then looked upwards and outwards to our politicians and policy makers. Fermanagh District Council's position on fracking at the moment is that we have called for a monitorium on fracking. That means that we want to see a halt on any fracking that would be programmed for Fermanagh until we gather more information. There's still many gaps in our information and we want to uh, wait on studies that have been completed to fill in those uh, gaps at this point. The process in which Fermanagh District Council came to its decision to call for a monitorium on fracking was that we invited both people that were against and for fracking to the council to give presentations to give councillors a greater understanding exactly what they were facing into. Uh, we listened to those uh, presentations. We decided that we would still like to hear from other studies that were being completed. We took a democratic vote within the council chamber then to uh, give every councillor the opportunity to have their say and that vote was that we should have a monitorium on fracking at this point in time until more information is gathered in and more studies are completed and hopefully then we will have the most current up-to-date information. This is a very, very serious issue that is affecting Fermanagh both today and in the future and we want to be very sure that the information that we have is the most accurate and current that we can have. In December 2011, the Northern Ireland Assembly voted for a moratorium on hydraulic fracturing. The Green Party was instrumental in bringing this moratorium about. We asked the party's leader what this moratorium actually means. The Green Party proposed a moratorium on fracking in Northern Ireland um, ultimately because we have major concerns about the process. Ultimately we'd like to see a ban but we recognised that we should take evidence based decisions in the Assembly and we wanted a moratorium until we could get in the evidence from the US EPA as well as European studies before Northern Ireland decides whether or not we should either introduce a ban or go ahead with fracking. Um, however, the Minister herself has said that um, she is not responding to the call for a moratorium because included in the motion was also a call to withdraw fracking licences. Now she says there are no fracking licences because whilst there is a petroleum licence which allows a test frack, she's not defined as a fracking licence because all her permissions are required. Now I think that's playing semantics with the issue and I think it's ignoring the spirit of the motion. Um, so even if she can't implement it word for word, um, and I'm not sure I accept that, but even if she can't, she could accept the spirit of the motion which was clearly calling for a moratorium until more evidence is in. And, and I think the Minister should follow through on that and I think it's regrettable that she isn't. In March 2013, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment announced its intention to issue another petroleum licence for the Loch Ness Basin covering highly populated parts of counties Antrim, Down, Tyrone, Londonderry and Armagh. It is expected that development by this licence will involve the use of hydraulic fracturing. On the 3rd of March 2013, we wrote to Arlene Foster in her official capacity as Minister for the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment at the Northern Ireland Assembly. We requested a filmed interview with her to explore Detty's position on hydraulic fracturing in Fermanagh and Northern Ireland as a whole. She declined to be interviewed. Instead, we were passed on to Michael Young, the Director of DETI's Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. I'm Mike Young. I'm the Director of the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland, which is an office of DETI, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we provide advice 
to DETI and other government departments on any matters geological and we undertake research in, geolo in ge geology and natural resources. There are four licenses that have been issued in Northern Ireland for petroleum exploration but none of them gives companies the li a permit to do any work on the ground or under the ground. The licence only provides some title to the reserves or resources that might be there. Any other work requires a range of consents and permits. Now, in the case of exploration drilling and fracking, that would be subject to the full planning process, which is a detailed process that considers all the engineering, environmental and social issues surrounding a development. And there's a very well-established process for that. It will require a 12-month environmental impact assessment. So it won't go forward until all the various issues have been considered carefully. Governments need to reduce the use of high carbon fossil fuels and replace them with renewables or nuclear power. To, there's inevitably a, a time gap before that can happen. Uh, it, it takes time to develop the renewables that we need. A bridge fuel is a term economists use as a, a term for the fuel that can be used during that transition. Talking about shale gas as a uh, bridge fuel is the industry's uh, clear uh, message of intent at the moment. Now one wonders whether it's a bridge fuel and if it's a bridge to nowhere. One of the main points that has come out of an awful lot of the shale gas studies uh, being done in the States is that the shale clays are not performing as well as the um, industry stated. That means the wells aren't performing and giving as much gas and the uh, shale clays themselves are being exhausted rather quick, more quickly than they thought. Also it turns out that shale is not as uniform as was first thought. So what's, ha what's clearly evident from the US is that once you start shale gas um, you have to drill and it would appear you have to drill in ever increasing numbers in order to keep the production levels going. Uh, this is because the decline rate on the fields uh, over a one year period is looking like something like about between 25 and 40 percent. So one is looking at a huge drilling program and so we may start today in Fermanagh but um, it'll quite quickly go from Fermanagh all the way through to the other side of the lakes, uh, Loch Erne, all the way up to Tyrone where there's shale, all the way down towards Clonus where there's shale, all the way down through Cavan, half a Cavan where there's shale, all the way down in Leitrim, down to South Leitrim, Roscommon where there's shale, all the way out to Mayo where there's shale, and even possibly if they decide for it, you have Donegal Bay where, which also is underlain with shale. Well, the role of the Environment Minister is on one hand uh, to be responsible for good planning in Northern Ireland and on the other hand to ensure there's proper environmental regulation of what's happening in Northern Ireland. That's the job of my department, my job as Minister, and that's the job that we would have in respect of any energy application. Um, in the event that fracking ever got the green light, then enforcement around any fracking operation would fall to the Health and Safety Executive, to the Environment Agency in terms of environmental and water assessments, the Planning Department in terms of ensuring the planning conditions were complied with, uh, the local Council in terms of environmental health impact, the full range of government agencies and other bodies would be responsible for regulating and managing any and all aspects of any fracking proposal, if it ever got the green light. Experience around the world is now clearly showing the very real threat that fracking poses to public health. Unfortunately, the Department of Health in Northern Ireland has been very slow to recognise this danger. In fact, the Northern Ireland Assembly as a whole appears too compartmentalised to address fracking holistically. Fracking is obviously uh, an issue of environmental health and, and certainly within the regulations that exist in Northern Ireland there will be requirements for an environmental impact uh, assessment. 
at this point it's almost been seen in Northern Ireland as fallen between the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment who are dealing with energy and the Department of Environment which obviously deals with environmental protection. The Department of Health currently in Northern Ireland would say this is not an issue for the Department of Health despite the growing evidence from around the globe that, that, there, that there are significant um, potential health impacts from, from, from fracking. And I, I think this is, I suppose, gets to the crux of a problem of governance in Northern Ireland and that we, we, we have departments operating in silos. And so if it doesn't seem to fall directly into a, a minister or a department's um, remit, then, then they don't look at the issue at all. And, you know, I would certainly have major concerns about that, that environmental impact assessment is not the place, you know, we do need a, a self, separate health impact assessment. Um, equally impact on water and we don't have the Department of Regional Development which covers covers water and um, so you know again there, there's two key departments that aren't in this debate that in my opinion should be. Early in 2013 amendments to the planning bill were put through the Northern Ireland Assembly giving an economic priority to planning permission decisions. There is suspicion that this amendment to the planning bill is being made to allow hydraulic fracturing companies to circumvent existing planning regulations. The new planning bill, currently passing through the Northern Ireland Assembly, is expected to make it much more difficult for communities to oppose planning permission granted to the hydraulic fracturing industry. Furthermore, it is believed that Detty's own geological survey of Northern Ireland is pushing hard to be the main regulator of the hydraulic fracturing industry in Northern Ireland. This raises huge concerns about genuine transparency and accountability. On the 19th of April 2013, we again contacted Arlene Foster, this time in her official capacity as an MLA elected from the constituency of Fermanagh and South Tyrone. We hand delivered a letter to her constituency office requesting a filmed interview with her to answer this question. Why do you think hydraulic fracturing will be a good thing for the people of County Fermanagh? She declined to be interviewed. You've got a, just an enormous amount of machinery. Did you hear the noise? We are aware that other community groups in Fermanagh have invited Arlene Foster to participate in discussion events around fracking in Fermanagh. Invitations, which she has also declined. We feel very strongly that politicians should engage in face-to-face -face discussion at the community level with people whose lives and livelihoods are directly affected by the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing. This applies especially to politicians elected by the very communities where fracking is likely to occur. Andy Adkins is Executive Director of Friends of the Earth UK and Chair of Friends of the Earth Europe. When he visited Fermanagh, we asked him to give us a broader perspective on fracking, both in terms of meeting our energy needs and its impacts on climate change. Friends of the Earth's position in relation to so-called fracking is that at the very least there should be a moratorium on it in this country until it's very clear that it can be well regulated and it won't do environmental damage. But we're moving towards calling for an all-out ban because the evidence we're increasingly getting is actually it does do damage, there's no way you can totally limit that. As I look across Europe, as, as in my role as Chair of Friends of the Earth Europe, I see a mixed picture. A number of countries are already realising how dangerous and unnecessary actually this is and are putting moratoriums on, on exploiting uh, uh, gas through this way, shale gas. But at the total European level, the European Commission has already said that even if we were to go fast forward and exploit all of the gas through fracking in Europe, it would still leave Europe 60% dependent on imported gas in 2040. There's no real gain from this. It doesn't help our energy security. It just makes climate change worse. The European Commission is saying, really, we shouldn't do this. We recognise that the human race needs energy and that energy has to come from somewhere. But if fracking is a bridge to nowhere, what are the other possibilities? Uh, my name is Michael Dore and I'm the Managing Director of Action Renewables, which is a renewable energy company based in Belfast. It was originally set up in 2003 by DETI to be its delivery wing for renewable energy. The funding from DETI has been withdrawn over the last three or four years and we're now a self-sufficient company. We're a not-for-profit charity. We're focused on renewable energy. We promote renewable energy. We work in the renewable energy industry. 
We do feasibility studies for all of the technologies and probably about 35 or 40 percent of all of the work that we do is outside Northern Ireland. The potential on the island of Ireland to develop renewable energy is substantial. When most people think of uh, renewable energy targets, most people refer back immediately to renewable electricity targets. You've got to remember that about a third of all of the energy that we use is electricity. The other two thirds is involved with transport fuels and with heating. First of all, renewable electricity, we have tremendous resources. The west coast of Ireland from wave energy, the north coast of Ireland both from offshore wind and also from tidal. And as most people are aware, we're already pr producing substantial amounts of electricity from onshore wind. That's going to continue to grow. We could be producing over 100% of our electricity requirement within 30 to 35 years. To do that, certain things would need to be in place. We'd need to change the infrastructure. But if you look at both onshore wind, offshore wind, tidal and wave, particularly off the west coast, we could be producing over 100%. There are going to be great changes in the way that the transport system operates in, north, in both north and south of Ireland over the next 20 to 30 years. There will be more electric vehicles. There will be more hybrid vehicles. There will also be vehicles running on liquid biofuels. It's very difficult to answer the question about the economic potential in Ireland because it's basically it falls into three sectors. You've got the economic benefit from development, you've got construction, and then you've got from operation. So you actually really need to look at it as being three sectoral elements. Overall, there was a, a report published in Northern Ireland about two years ago that said the renewable energy potential, this is just in Northern Ireland, is two billion pounds. There's another report published in the Republic of Ireland about three years ago that indicated across the whole island of Ireland it's about 7.6 billion. But what does that mean in real terms? When you're talking about job creation, at the moment in Northern Ireland there are something like 1,200 people employed in the renewable energy industry. For those figures that I've just indicated to be appropriate, we're probably looking at upwards of 30 to 40,000 people in Northern Ireland, which is over 100,000 people if you scale it up to the island of Ireland. At a UK-wide level, there's one really important thing the UK government needs to do, and that is to go full speed ahead in so-called decarbonising our electricity system. Most of our, or the biggest single source of our emissions in this country is actually from the way we produce our electricity, from gas, from oil, from coal to a small extent. We need to switch that to renewable energy as fast as we can in order to meet our international and our national targets for cutting fossil fuel emissions for uh, uh, addressing climate change. That affects Northern Ireland, that affects Wales, England, Scotland. Um, we think anything that could be done here in Northern Ireland to help that uh, would be well worth doing. We believe it is very inconsistent for our government to sign up to carbon emission reduction targets and yet still pursue fossil fuel extraction on such a large scale. What do others think? I think there is a paradox between the way in which the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Northern Ireland Government have committed to renewable energy targets, but at the same time they've still got an objective to promote the gas industry within Northern Ireland. Now, I think they need to resolve that to allow us to move forward in a structured way. Certainly we think at Friends of the Earth that for the government to carry on saying that it wants to cut our carbon emissions, to sign up to international agreements to do so, but then to carry on um, exploiting fossil fuels is really inconsistent. Sooner or later, and it needs to be sooner, it's going to have to stop exploiting fossil fuels like gas through fracking if it is going to meet our international and in fact our domestically legislated carbon targets. And it's so important um, because with changing weather patterns, our ability to grow food, our ability to run our economies the way we've been doing so, um, so many things about the way we live will be affected. And unless we act fairly fast, we will end up in a very serious situation as human beings, as the human race, as well as it being incredibly damaging to nature as well. I think that the overall picture of fracking needs to be taken in a, 
a wide view of society that what is about to happen is not just public health, it's not just about regulations, it's not just about chemicals, it's the fact that this is a short term boom and bust industry. Ireland and has been through a boom and bust industry recently where we were told that the regulators would keep a close eye on things and they didn't. We run the risk of causing long term problems for our society. So we do know that Ireland and the UK has to go down a renewable route for energy in this century. We can start going down that in the next 10 or 15 years with a clean country or in 25 years with a dirty country. Already it's been announced that there's a massive infrastructure development on the island of Ireland for renewable energies and these things are sustainable. So we need sustainable policies that will protect public health. The most valuable thing that we have underground here, which is a natural resource, is water. And that at the moment is a health benefit. If that water became a health risk, that would change the scenario, not just for agriculture and tourism, but for the future of public health on our, on our island of Ireland long term. I believe that this land, you know, where we are, it doesn't belong to us. You know, we're, we're custodians. We get to use it for the time we're here. It was given to us in good order. And I think it's our duty to keep it in good order and pass it on to the generations to come. You know, it's for our kids, for our future. And I think the reality is that if we give it away to Tamborne, because if we let them, you know, if we let them come and do what they're proposing to do, we have given it away. It's gone. It can't be replaced. We can't get it back. What they will give us back will not be the same thing. And we will be responsible for what we've done. To the people of Fermanagh, the laws, the best in the world laws and regulations do not protect you from this new experiment of the brute force hydraulic fracturing and the new experiment of the super fracking. And I say to you, with your feisty creativity, I believe that you and the world, we can all do much better than allowing such an experiment in our communities. Look to what you can do in your own communities to create your own jobs and become sustainable and truly proud standing on your own without a dirty industry, experimenting and using you and your children as guinea pigs in this frack experiment.